My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks, including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. As always, thank you for all of your support, and we hope to see you there. When I was a little boy of about six or seven, I remember going to my grandfather's cabin, deep in the woods of Idaho, with him and several of his hunting buddies. My father, my uncles, and several of their male cousins were also at the cabin with the group. I will give you just a little backstory, so you understand better what they were all doing out there in the first place. The men would have these hunting parties that they would be on for a week at a time, and they would leave the women home alone with the kids and in charge of the household duties that they always attended to anyways. The women would have their Tupperware parties and church functions, so once a month, the men would go out to the cabin and hunt. Afterwards, though, when all of the hunting was over and done with until the next month, they would pick up all the male children from their wives and bring them out to the cabin to spend time with the men. It was sort of like a rite of passage in my family, that you would finally be invited to the cabin to hang out with the big boys. It started when you were five years old and could use the bathroom on your own and eat regular food. So basically, when you didn't need as much care, then you would be allowed to go to the cabin with the men. I know this sounds sexist and somewhat unreal, but it was a different time, and it all seemed perfectly normal. My family wasn't the only family that had a dynamic like this. When the men would be out hunting for the week, all the wives would stay at a different one of their houses, alternating each month whose home it would be. The women loved it just as much as the men did, and I never heard anyone arguing or fighting over the activities. It was my first time being at the cabin, and as my father's only male child and my grandfather's favorite grandchild, I felt like a little king among men. I didn't have to help with anything, and I didn't take a great interest in anything except eating and listening to the men talk about their adventures out in the woods. Adventures in which I had no interest in ever being a part of. I feared the woods, but I never knew why. My mother told me much later in life that something had happened to me when I was out in the woods around our house and that I had been screaming that a large monkey had attacked me. There aren't any monkeys in rural Alabama. I wonder now, knowing what I do about what's in those woods, if it wasn't a Bigfoot that had run at me or something. I'll never know and no one else saw the creature, so it's a dead point I guess, but I thought it was worth mentioning. I remember the men were having a few beers and they were all eating and smoking cigarettes out on the back deck of the cabin while the kids played in the yard. The yard was like most cabins and surrounded by woods that were connected to it. The kids there ranged in age from 5 to 12 years old because once you turned 18, you were allowed to attend the entire week-long event if you chose, but if you didn't choose to, then you weren't allowed to go into the cabin at all. I don't understand the logic but it was some real man's man type stuff that just wouldn't fly today. The cabin was very isolated, even though there were other cabins of the same type all throughout the woods. But it's just that we never saw any neighbors, and our fathers and the older men had no interest in bringing strangers or outsiders into their little group. They all took it very seriously. The music was loud, and there was so much food and laughter. I remember thinking that this is what life should always be like, I was having so much fun, and I never wanted it to end. I was playing with some of the other kids my age, while the older boys mostly kept to themselves and didn't want to be bothered with the babies, of which I was considered one. I was running around playing tag with them when I first spotted something out of the ordinary. I must mention here that I don't have that many memories at all of this time in my life, and I have come to find out that most people don't, but when I tell you I remember almost every single detail of that night as though it happened yesterday, I'm not lying or exaggerating. I stopped short when I was running a little bit into the woods to try and find one of my cousins, but what I saw looked like yellow glowing eyes peeking out at me from the trees. Something about that must have triggered me, because I pointed and started yelling that there was a monkey man in the woods. My cousins all just laughed, and though most of them looked where I was pointing, 
None of them said they saw it, too. The adults were too far away on the deck with the music too loud to hear what was happening. Then I saw more than one set of eyes, and they looked like they were at all different heights all around the woods. I was scared, and I went screaming and crying to my father. My cousins all followed me, and I think that's when they saw it, too. The men didn't even bother to try and listen to what we were saying, and immediately assumed we were all cranky and tired, and that we needed to be put to sleep. They put us all to sleep in the same room, and there were three beds. Two of them were sets of bunk beds. I was scared, but I didn't want to say anything in case none of the other kids had seen it. Plus, I figured if it was anything to worry about, then the grown-ups would have at least investigated. And since they seemed to not care at all, I decided to try and just go to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and jumped up in my bed. Every one of my cousins who were in the room with me all woke up at the same time. We had all heard gunshots and immediately started crying. The older boys had come into the room almost immediately and tried comforting us. We all wanted to know what was happening, and one of them said that animals were attacking the cabin. There was shot after shot ringing out in the living room, and we heard glass shatter. I got up and peeked out the door, but could only see all the men lined up and aiming their guns all around the cabin, directing them towards the outside. I went and looked out of the window of the bedroom I was in, and I saw at least a dozen of these ape-man creatures, of all shapes and sizes, but all of them had those yellow glowing eyes, and they were coming towards the cabin from the woods. They were walking through the yard still when I finally looked, but they were fast approaching the cabin. I kept watching until suddenly there was an upside-down face in the window on the opposite side of me, and I screamed and backed away from the window. My oldest cousin, he was 17, looked out the other window, and I heard him say that they were everywhere. They were hanging on the cabin. They were on the roof, jumping all around, and they were pounding on the sides of the cabin, too. They seemed to be everywhere, but at the end of the day, I think the final count had to be 15. The men were shooting through the cabin walls at them at first, but that was causing us kids to be in such a state of trauma, terror, and turmoil that one of them finally suggested they all go outside. They were scared, I'm sure, but didn't really have a choice, as they were also destroying the cabin, trying to get the creatures off the property and away from there. They closed the front door behind them, but all the kids were looking out the windows. The men were shooting at these strange creatures as they roared and banged the trees, the cabin itself, and their chests. They ranged in size from 12 feet to 5 feet tall, and everything in between. They were grabbing the garbage and throwing it all around. Finally, the shooting stopped as the ape men started to retreat into the woods. The men were shaken. You could tell as they re-entered the cabin. They discussed taking turns, staying up for the rest of the night, and making sure the creatures didn't come back. I remember my father coming into the room and asking me if I was okay. I asked him what they wanted, and he said, after all that, all they seemed to have wanted was food. He then kissed me and left the room. Our trip ended a few days early and the next morning we were all packed up and headed home again. The trips continued right up until very recently, though a lot of the dynamic had changed. There was no more hunting, and really the cabin just became what it is today, which is a place for the whole family to get together on vacation. Those of us who were there that night often talk about it, and it recently came up again. We can only go by what the adults told us, but as we got older, we were all bound to ask what it was all about at one point in our lives, and we were all told generally the same thing. The men that were there that night had been cooking a ton of food, as I already said, and the smell must have permeated the forest. The creatures, which everyone has accepted as having been Bigfoot creatures at this point, must have smelled it and were lining up in the woods for when everyone was inside so that they could raid the trash. There had been reports of strange creatures going through the trash in all the cabins in that area at the time. But what happened was one of the men got a little too drunk, and he angrily threw a glass bottle into the woods, which sounded funny when it landed and smashed. It caused the men in the group to laugh and finally call it a night, but he must have hit one of the smaller Bigfoot. Maybe he hit one of the bigger ones, who knows. It just makes more sense the other way, because I have done a lot of research on Bigfoot creatures, and it seems they become aggressive when it comes to their young. One of my uncles told my cousins that one of the little ones was bleeding from the head and on the back of one of the largest ones out there, 
and so he reasoned it was one of the young ones that had been hit. Eventually, the firefight and damage to the cabin ended when they noticed this and put together that it must have somehow been their fault. The men put their guns down and their hands up, and one by one started apologizing. As they did that, the creatures stopped attacking and making all the noise and stopped too. The uncle, who had thrown the bottle, apologized and ran inside to grab a bunch of food that we didn't eat and brought it out. The creatures scooped it up and ended up taking basically all of it before retreating into the woods. I never expected to write about this encounter because most people who weren't there don't believe me, and we've all even had a hard time convincing our wives that it really happened. However, recently, I went on a popular website for people to share encounter stories, and I saw someone talking about a somewhat famous case where a cabin was attacked by several Bigfoot, and none of them ended up shot or injured, even though several men had been shooting at them too. That happened in Pennsylvania, though. But it was still interesting enough and gave me enough validation to share the story. Thanks for letting me get it out there. Bigfoot are seemingly peaceful creatures until you invade their personal space or mess with their young. Somewhat like humans, and for that I can relate. I have seen the yellow eyes a few times while out in the cabin, but I don't call anyone's attention to it. But I do make sure that I leave some food out for them that night. It's never there in the morning, but who knows? Maybe it's other animals, and I'm just talking myself into believing what I want to be true. I've only been lost twice in my life. Once in a thick forest where I couldn't get my bearings, and the second time in a cave. Both times were unsettling to someone who prides themselves on being competent outdoors, and both taught me humility, which didn't last long. The worst by far was in the cave. I guess it proved that I wasn't very competent indoors either. But it wasn't being lost that got to me. It was what I found in there. For those of you who know the Glenwood Springs, Colorado area, you'll know the surrounding flat tops wilderness is riddled with caves where water has dissolved large cavities in the limestone. I used to live in Glenwood, and I've explored a few of those caves, including Hubbard Cave and Fairy Cave. I was never much of a cave explorer, having a touch of claustrophobia, but I had to give it a try. So I decided to visit a cave just above the freeway near No Name, a residential area that lies just outside of Glenwood Springs. This particular cave is known as the Cave of the Clouds. It sits high in the cliffs and takes a bit of huffing and puffing to get to. The trail has since been deemed a safety hazard by the local sheriff, and people are discouraged from going up there. It was a sunny day, and my friend Chris and I packed a lunch and drove up there, parking along the freeway. We soon headed straight up the cliffs, following a treacherous old aqueduct that hangs from them. The hike up was strenuous, but we made it, and we soon entered the cave, which has two large rooms. The first room has been heavily vandalized, and then we went into the second room, which had a rubby rock surface. It was black as night in there, and our little headlamps didn't do much. We were amateur cavers, and didn't really have the right equipment. Unbeknownst to me, Chris wandered back into the first room, leaving me to my own devices. Right off, I noticed a strong stench in there, and I think that's why Chris left. I wanted to leave too, but I also knew I probably wouldn't be climbing back up that cliffside anytime soon, and I wanted to check out the cave. I'd be quick, I decided. I crawled through a couple of the small squeezeways that didn't really go anywhere, and then came back into the second room. Things were very black and the dim glow from the first room didn't enter that second room. My small headlamp didn't do much, and the stench seemed to be getting worse. Plus, I was starting to feel kind of weird. It's hard to describe, but I felt eerie. I decided I should just go back out and forget about exploring this one. I stood there for a bit, wondering where Chris had gone and calling out to him, but there was no answer. I then jumped down from a large rock that I was standing on, catching the metal water bottle that was attached to my belt on another smaller rock, jamming it hard into my ribs. The pain was intense, and I knew I'd probably cracked or broken a couple of them. Having broken my ribs once before, when I got thrown from a horse, I knew what the pain felt like. I sat down for a while, dizzy, and feeling like I might pass out from the pain. After a while, I decided I needed to go home, so I stood up and began making my way back to what I thought was the first room. Nope. Dead end. A wall. I turned around and retraced my path, hitting another wall. This went on for some time, and believe me, 
wandering around this room in the dark with what turned out to be two broken ribs was a challenge. I was totally disoriented at this point. I sat down on a rock, not sure what to do. I was lost. I was really in no shape to be exploring, and this pain was getting more intense. I inadvertently started moaning a bit. Man, there's nothing like having a broken rib. It's intense. After what seemed like forever, but was probably about ten minutes, I was sitting there, now half crying, hoping Chris would come and look for me. I was in so much pain, and I could barely move at that point. I suddenly stopped, for my sixth sense told me to shut up. Someone or something was in there with me. I didn't want to advertise my presence, though I knew it was way too late. I sat there, really quiet, and then I realized the stench was getting stronger, much stronger. Now I could hear a breathing, and it sounded like something really big, something with huge lungs. It was really raspy, and a slow kind of deep breathing. Now I was beginning to think that I was in there with a bear, and that really scared me. This is not a really large cave. Mind you, there's only one entrance, which I now couldn't find for the life of me. Imagine yourself sitting in a dark cave with broken ribs, in pain, lost. Knowing you can't just stumble around trying to get out because there's a deep pit somewhere, and your light isn't good enough to see much of where you're going. That alone is bad enough, but add a stench to the recipe, as well as something big nearby, breathing hard, and it all made me feel like I was about to throw up. Now add a pair of red glowing eyes suddenly appearing, which aren't that far from you. Just out of nowhere, two very large eyes, like someone plugged in a circuit or something. This was the final straw for me. I was so scared, I just got up and fled as best as I could in the opposite direction. Whatever it was didn't follow me, but it stayed put. I'll have nightmares about what now happened for the rest of my life. I turned back to see if it was following me. The eyes suddenly rose a good eight or nine feet off the ground. Whatever this thing was, it must have stood up. It then picked up a rock and lobbed it at me, barely missing me. Now what could I do? Here came another rock, and then another. I ducked, but I was nearly hit multiple times. The pain from moving quickly almost made me black out. Then a small rock hit my backpack, and I just lost it. I mean lost it. I started yelling and screaming as loud as I could hoping that Chris would hear me and come help. In the meantime, this creature lobbed another rock my way. I started inching along the wall away from it, feeling my way and using my light as best as I could. Here came another rock, and I panicked and I took off my headlamp, holding it out and shining it towards the creature. I had to know who or what my enemy was. I was ready to collapse, and I knew it would all be over at that point. My light was kind of dim, so it didn't show much except a big black shadowy figure with glowing eyes, but it was huge, and I mean huge. I kept trying to feel my way along the wall and get away. Suddenly, I could hear Chris's voice calling out, and I started yelling again. A light. Chris was here. I yelled out, and he came over and found me, commenting on the stench. I had no time for words, but I told him that we needed to get the hell out of there, and I followed him hanging onto the back of his belt so that I wouldn't lose him. We entered the main room where there was more light, and then he stopped, but I pushed him ahead of me in a panic, saying that we had to keep going. We were soon out of the cave where it had started raining. It was then that this creature started screaming like a banshee, so loud that it echoed through the cavern. Chris then realized what was going on, and we both panicked and hoofed it down to the muddy cliffs and to the car. The worst part of the experience wasn't the broken ribs, nor the feeling of complete and total disorientation, nor the feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, but rather the sheer terror of having a Bigfoot in there with me. And I know that's what it was, especially since there have been other encounters in that same area. That was the last wild cave I've been in and will ever go into again, believe me. I still have nightmares about being in there with that wild creature. Chris says I have PTSD and maybe so, but I do know that I'll never go into a cave ever again. My name is Nathan, and I encountered a Sasquatch nearly 15 years ago from the day I'm writing this. It's been so long since then, yet I'm still in awe over what happened. I've always thought that the Smoky Mountain Range is one of the eeriest places I've been to, 
and that feeling took on a whole new meaning in the late summer of 2006. I had taken an excellent job in Asheville, North Carolina, but it wasn't long before the demanding workload led me towards some unhealthy habits. In a nutshell, I was eating poorly, rarely working out, and had started regularly smoking cigarettes because I was convinced they kept me energized throughout the day. It wasn't until my sister Hannah came to visit me that I acknowledged how much weight I had gained. She was very blunt about it and went as far to tell me that I looked like a different person, and not at all in a good way. I felt hurt when she said it, but I thanked Hannah for the much-needed wake-up call. It was because of Hannah's harsh words that I began hiking every other day. But I didn't just stick to the trails. I would venture into the thicket so that I would have to push through whatever the environment presented. Some people might think that's a bit unnecessary, but I saw it as a way to jumpstart a healthier lifestyle. I wanted to struggle. I figured the harder I worked, the quicker the weight would fall off of me. Anyhow, I was a few months into my new regimen when I spotted something strange from afar. Fortunately, I was high up on a ridge, and I saw the figure was maybe 60 feet below me. That probably sounds way too close to some people, but it could have been a heck of a lot worse. At first glance, I thought this thing was an overgrown chimpanzee. Of course, I know those animals aren't native to North America, but I assumed this one had either escaped a zoo or the confines of some rich person's backyard. It wasn't long before that assumption went right through the window. As soon as this creature turned its head slightly to the left, its facial features made it known that this was no chimpanzee. It was unlike anything I had seen before. Suddenly, I was overcome by this feeling that I wasn't supposed to be anywhere near that area. It felt a bit like I was trespassing, and one of the worst things that could happen would be for me to get caught. It was the most unusual sensation I had ever felt. I now think it was because I was in the presence of one of the world's greatest predators. Because of that unsettling feeling, I slowly began backing away. I thought I had already gotten lucky with the creature somehow not noticing me, and I didn't want to push that by turning and making tons of noise. I was so thankful that its back was turned when I arrived. I had only maybe taken around four small steps backwards, when I suddenly felt like my breath had been taken away from me in an instant. The cracking noise from stepping on a stick seemed to echo for miles, I would have gulped when the creature spun its gaze and locked eyes with me, but it was as if I no longer possessed the strength for even that. There was something so peculiar about making eye contact with the creature, making the experience feel so much more real than it had only a few moments earlier. We were a reasonable distance apart, but the look in its eyes is something I'll never forget. For just a moment, I had the impression that it was more worried about me seeing it than I was about it seeing me but that quickly changed. Soon the creature formed a shape with its lips that was unlike anything I've seen from any human. As I attempt to mimic it while I write this, it quickly becomes evident that our facial muscles can't accomplish it. While the creature did this, it revealed the upper row of yellowish-brown teeth. I thought they looked pretty similar to typical human teeth, only larger, to match the size of its massive jowls. Even though the strangeness caused me to feel trapped for some time, It couldn't have been more than a few seconds before it emanated a noise that reminded me of a samurai warrior. That must come off as such an unusual way of putting it, but believe me when I tell you that everything about this situation was unpredictable, and the encounter immediately proved to me just how little we know about these things. My mind was having such difficulty processing nearly everything about the situation, but shortly after that, my mind was forced to only care about getting away. After uttering its strange language, the creature hurled a good-sized stone my way. It landed a few feet before me, causing dust to burst onto my sneakers and lower pant legs. The creature then vanished from my sight, but I knew it was climbing up the ridge towards me based on the direction it had gone. Finally, I regained enough control over my muscles to turn and start running. From there on out, all I did was focus on the ground in front of me paying careful attention not to lose my balance or trip on the treacherous terrain. My ears managed to do a fine job of alerting me that the creature was indeed following me, but the sounds of the sporadic, samurai-like chatter never once seemed to be very close. And eventually, the noise altogether stopped, leaving me to listen to my thumping heart and lungs gasping for air. I barely remember that drive home. 
I barely recall arriving at my car. It actually didn't seem like it was until later that night that I started to finally come to. It was as though I was in a long dream. Although I know I wasn't asleep for it, there was undoubtedly an uncanny resemblance to how it feels when you're amid a strange and terrifying dream. For example, even though I've never much believed in ghosts, I'd be lying if I claimed not to have horrifying nightmares about them. I'll sporadically dream where I think I'm alone in my home or someone else's home, and a specter then approaches me. While my Sasquatch encounter felt very like that, only it actually occurred. I implore you to keep a watchful eye when you're exploring our forests, especially if you're out there by yourself. My girlfriend and I were camping along Highway 128 in California. We stayed in an area called Hendy Woods. Hendy Woods is in the Redwood Belt between Boonville and the coast. There are several stands of old-growth redwoods in the area. We decided to go to Montgomery Woods one morning, being told it was not a camping area, and wouldn't have the motorhomes and kid-filled campsites, and the trees preserved there were spectacular. We arrived at the Montgomery Woods at about 8 a.m., and were going to hike the self-guided trail. The parking area is small, and it looked like we were the first, if not the only ones there. It was a cool, foggy September day. About a half hour into the hike, my girlfriend thought she heard someone on the trail behind us. We stopped and waited, but there was no noise. We continued to the base of a huge redwood and sat to rest. The redwoods are an eerily quiet place, with the thick, soft redwood bark and ankle-deep tree leaves, absorbing lots of ambient sound. Suddenly we heard something moving through the undergrowth, about 20 or 30 yards away from the canopy of trees. It was big, heavy, and it was moving at a good pace. I whistled, and the movement stopped. This was the most scared I have ever been. It was silent for a minute or so, and then the movement continued. Whatever it was, it was so close, and I was frustrated that I could only see the brush moving, but not the creature. It stopped moving about a hundred feet or so away, and then it let out a scream that would scare the dead. We froze, thinking this was it. From behind us, several hundred yards to the west, came a similar scream, as if responding to the first. We looked back, but we couldn't tell exactly where it came from. And then the first creature screamed again, louder and longer than the first time. I can't tell you how loud it was. The lung capacity was enormous. I can remember thinking that we might be surrounded, and that we might die there. Suddenly the first creature started to move, not away, but parallel to the trail. There was a bit of a clearing, and we saw the left side of a seven-foot-tall, hair-covered creature. I've met Shaquille O'Neal at the LA airport, and this thing was so much bulkier, huge through the chest and shoulders. I only saw the left arm really, and the wrist was at the diameter of my biceps, it looked at us for two or three seconds, and then turned to its right and hustled down the ravine. We looked through the trees to follow its progress, but we had waited a minute or two, and then it was gone. My name is Philip. I am 25 years old and an avid outdoors man. I grew up in the outdoors, playing outside, fishing, hiking, canoeing. I have held something inside of me for years. A buddy and myself were out fishing at a local creek in a very populated town, but it still had a lot of dense woods and is on the edge of a park. We were hiking, talking, and having a good time catching fish. I first noticed it started to smell like musty urine, and I turned to him and I said, do you smell that? Being out of high school, we both made pee jokes at each other. So we crossed the creek and worked out way up the stream and didn't think about it again. When we got near the stream crossing again, I heard footsteps behind me. I didn't think a lot of it, and I continued to walk a little more, when I heard a louder footstep and some twigs break. At this point, I said, hold on man, something is following us. As I said this, I caught a glimpse of something, almost a shadow, no certain shape or anything. As soon as I saw this, something growled roared at us. I can't even describe the noise that it made, but I felt it. I swear on my mother's grave, I felt vibrations in my chest. Needless to say, we didn't stay long. We hightailed it out of there and up the road in record time. 
This wasn't my first experience either. Last summer, I took my girlfriend, now fiancé, camping in Hawking Hills, Ohio. This place is in the back of beyond. When we got there on Thursday afternoon, it was relatively vacant, with the exception of a couple camping at the trailhead. That first evening has made me never want to go camping again, which for me is a very depressing thing. This, I might also add, makes me not want to even go outside at night. We live in the country, and I am absolutely terrified. Anyways, it was about 10.15 p.m., and I had just put the fire out, and we crawled into our tent for the evening. While at around 1.15 a.m., I was awoken by some shuffling around the tent. In a haze, I woke up, and I swear to the good Lord Almighty, I saw something looking into my tent. Not thinking clearly, I didn't even bat an eyelash. I thought I was dreaming. The one reason I know it wasn't a dream is because of the grunting I clearly remember hearing. So I fell back asleep, and about 3.45 a.m., I woke up and went to go to the bathroom. As I got out of the tent and started to go, I was looking out into the woods with the moonlight coming through. I saw something peeking at me from behind a tree. I wiped the coals out of my eyes and I focused a little more. As I did this, I couldn't believe my eyes. I saw this beast. It was a shorter one, about six and a half feet. The longer I stood there, it became more brazen. At one point, it came out from behind the tree and it had its hand placed on the tree that it had been peeking from and it was just kind of standing there making this grunting noise. I didn't even stay around to get more of a look at it. I hopped back into my tent and just shut my eyes and covered up. Thinking back, it could have done anything if it had wanted me. I was wondering what your opinions of these incidences were. Should I be afraid to go do the things I love, or am I just being a baby? In September of 1980, my friend Janice and I decided we were going to have an adventure. We were going to college in a small country town, so that meant we either had to find the gang or drive to the next nearest. We were going to college in a small country town, so that meant we had to either find the gang or or drive into the next largest city. We decided to go where everyone meets, near the Trinity River, not too far from McKinney, Texas. We had gotten to our usual hangout spot just before dark, and we were the first ones on the scene. We decided to start gathering some wood for the fire before it got too late. Janice was the first one out of the car and started scouting around. I parked off the road a bit, and when I joined up with her, I saw that she was pointing towards the road ahead. Her eyes were open so wide, and she looked like she was in shock. I had my keys in my hand, ready to run for the car if I needed to. When I looked over to see what she was pointing at, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. About 75 yards in front of us, and silhouetted against the setting sun, I could see a huge figure walking towards us. It was walking upright on two legs, but it didn't really look like a human. It was covered in a brown-grayish hair or fur. It was shaggy all rough and jagged. It was standing in the middle of the road and stopped when it saw us. It had to be at least seven feet tall and built like a massive football player. Janice and I were instantly terrorized, and we both ran back to the car and jumped in, locking the doors immediately. I looked in the mirror behind me to see where it had gone, but I only caught a fleeting glimpse of what the creature was as it disappeared into the thick underbrush on the side of the road. My first instinct was to start the car and tear off down the road, but that would mean I would have to pass it, and I didn't know where it had disappeared to. If it was on the side of the road, it could easily jump on my little car and rip the ragtop roof. If we stayed in our car with the doors locked, it could circle through the brush before the rest of our friends got here. I panicked, and I didn't know what to do. I started my car and I peeled out, leaving half a built fire. I threw on my brights and began honking the horn in hopes of scaring it away. I sped down the road and headed back to the dorms. The next day, I decided to report the event to the Collin County Sheriff. I told the sheriff everything that I could remember about the incident. He asked if there was any unusual animal noises or smells. I hadn't really thought about it before, but I told the sheriff there was a rancid skunk smell, and I drove right through it before I got to the site of where the campfire was going to be built. I had to think about it, but I didn't remember any sounds of animals, which is a bit weird. There are always birds or animals scurrying around. 
It wasn't normal for the area to be that quiet. The sheriff casually dismissed our encounter and said we had probably seen a bear and I scared him off with the lights and the radio. I went back and told my friend that the sheriff said we most likely saw a bear. Neither one of us bought that. Janice's boyfriend was with her when I told her, and he was really interested in things like Bigfoot and other unexplainable creatures. He wanted us to take him back to the area where we saw it. Janice said no, but I told him I would drive him out there and show him. It was early enough in the day, so there was a lot of light. It didn't take long to get there. Janice's boyfriend got out of my car and looked around. I stayed inside. He started pointing to tree limbs that were snapped off of the trees. There were a few saplings that had been broken about six feet up. The top parts of the trees were bent over. They looked like they were forming a right angle. Janice's boyfriend looked around on the ground, pushing pine needles with rocks and his foot. When he got back in the car, he told me that he thought this was a Bigfoot nest. He told me that there were several areas off the road where limbs were broken and woven together, making something like a bed for a Bigfoot. He also said that the thin saplings were broken and bent, and they were markers left by Bigfoot for other creatures. He said Bigfoot had been known to do that to mark their territory, and it was a keep-out or a warning sign for others. The unusual rancid skunk smell had disappeared, and all the birds had started to sing again. Whatever was there that night before had vanished. It was 2002, and I was tired of working the graveyard shift. I worked for the Department of Transportation in the remote town of Lake Iliamna, Alaska. We don't get much traffic through this area, but it was important to keep the state running to use these utility roads. If these roads were inaccessible, the state could go down. Typically, there's two of us clearing these roads, but my help was running a little behind due to the storm that we were in the middle of. The long, dark nights and bitter cold winters had taken their toll on me, and I dreamt of escaping to warmer climates like Florida. And a massive storm had blanketed the town in a thick layer of snow. As the main snowplow operator, it was my duty to clear the roads and ensure the safety of the residents. The wind was howling, and the snowflakes were creating a chaotic frenzy under the dim glow of my headlights. It was one of the hardest nights that I had worked in a long time. I couldn't wait until my backup arrived. I plowed through the snow-covered streets. I'm ashamed to admit this, but I was more into my daydreaming with my thoughts of sandy beaches and palm trees than doing my job. This night, something felt different. Things were quiet on the radio, and despite the wind, I couldn't even hear that either. A haunting sense of unease settled over me. I felt as if I was being watched, but I felt silly, like anything could see me out here, even when I could barely see anything out there. I dismissed it as paranoia. When you're alone on the roads of Alaska, you're definitely alone out there. I tried blaming it on the long hours and the lack of sleep, but that gut feeling stuck with me. I continued my work, and that's when I saw it. A movement caught my eye in the distance. Through the snowflakes, I glimpsed a figure standing on the edge of the road. It was tall and covered in a matted hair from head to toe. I slowed down, expecting to see a tree. I thought maybe Jody in accounting made good on her threat to spike my jug of coffee, because there was no way that I had just seen what I thought I had just seen. My heart dropped so fast, and I thought I was going to faint. I came to the impossible realization of what I was actually seeing. It was the hairy man, or Bigfoot. You see all sorts of weird things on the road. This could be anything, just not that. I could tell you I've seen some spooky things, like hitchhikers that disappear, or black figures running across the street at breakneck speed. I've been down these roads a hundred times. If it was a cartoon, my jaw would have been on the floor. The wind and snow settled down a little bit, and I had never wished for more snow in my life as I had at that moment. Even in the layers of snow, I could see the hairy man's eyes, and they glowed with an angry intensity. They reflected some sort of rage that I didn't ever want to see. One thing was clear. It was pissed. It had long arms that hung down to its knees, ending in razor-sharp claws that glistened with a sickly sheen. This thing's face was a grotesque combination of human and beast, with a snout-like nose and sharp fangs protruding from its mouth, and its fur was thick with chunks of ice. 
I watched as this creature started to charge my snowplow. Its heavy footsteps left deep imprints in the snow. Panic surged within me as I realized that escape was impossible. This storm had trapped me into this nightmare. In a desperate attempt to evade the hairy man, I swerved the snowplow sharply to the left. I was going to be in deep trouble if he made contact. The massive vehicle skidded on the icy road, its tires struggling for traction. With a slide and a crunch, the snowplow flipped onto its side, trapping me inside. My door was blocked by snow, and this hairy man roared as if in triumph. It closed in on the overturned snowplow, and its claws scraped against the metal. I braced myself for the inevitable attack, but to my surprise, this creature hesitated. This hairy man's attention shifted towards a distant noise, the sound of an approaching snowplow blade. My backup had finally caught up to me. It slammed the side of the plow in frustration. It turned away from me and disappeared into the snow, leaving me bewildered and also relieved. I heard the annoying scraping come closer and then finally stopping. I've never been so happy to see another person in my life. Better to be late than never show up, I guess. Seeing my flipped plow, he popped his head in and asked if I was okay. He then radioed for help from his plow. I remember feeling equally stupid for not thinking about the radio, but I came to find out that my radio had actually blown a fuse. As the sirens grew louder, the rescue team arrived at the scene. They quickly assessed the situation and worked to free me from the overturned vehicle. I stumbled out, shaken, but grateful to be alive. I figured this was the perfect sign that moving to Florida was definitely the right path for me. This was a few years back when my wife and I split up, and I ended up living in my office. I can tell you that was a very depressing time for me for sure. She kicked me out of the house as I had taken up drinking again after a five-year hiatus, and she was fed up. I don't blame her, but I just had too much stress going on, and that was my escape. I'm totally off this stuff now, and I can say I wasn't drinking when any of this happened. So she was living in our nice big house, and I had my office. I couldn't afford to live anywhere else because I was still making the house payment. It's a little standalone building right on Main Street, kind of sinking into the ground on one side and at least 100 years old. It has a big lot behind it that's nothing but weeds, but it does give a little privacy. I didn't want anyone to know that I was living there, as it's not zoned residential, and I was afraid I would get a code violation. So I was kind of laying low the entire time, parking around the back. The building next door was abandoned. My office had one big room and a bathroom, and that was it, and big windows, which made it hard to sneak around until I covered them with tarps. I set up a cot in one corner and put a sleeping bag and a pad on it, and that was my new place. Nobody ever came to visit because nobody knew I was there, even though it was my office. I didn't run the kind of business that people would come to. My job was coordinating truck shipments by phone and fax, and I never saw anybody. Now this was a little town, and right across the street next to the burger joint was a somewhat seedy motel, though it had seen better days. It was called the Robber's Hideaway, after some outlaws who had robbed a bank 50 miles away and probably never set foot in our little town. When the burger joint shut down their lights for the night, I would hang up my tarps so nobody would see me sleeping, if they happened to walk by, which nobody ever did, to my knowledge anyways. It was a very quiet part of a dying little town, so every night I would crawl into my sleeping bag on the cot and try to sleep. The office didn't have much for heat, so it would usually take a while for me to get warm, and then I would drift off. The next morning, I would be so stiff and sore, and I could barely move. I would get up, make some coffee, wash up a bit, and then be right back at it, working, sometimes not even shaving until late morning. It was a hell of a way to live. After about a week or so of this, I was getting pretty desperate. I was lonely, and it seemed like I never went anywhere. I was getting more and more depressed, and now my wife had filed for divorce, so it didn't look like things would be getting better anytime soon. It seemed that the nights were the worst, so I decided I needed to get out, be outside, get some new perspective. But where to go? I wasn't a bar type, in spite of drinking, which I had stopped for good anyways. 
I decided that I would get out and start driving around and see what was out there, even if it was evening before I could start because of work. I started out just driving around town, up and down the residential streets, but that made me miss having a home. So I branched out and started driving the country roads, out where the farms are. That wasn't much better. It just made me feel lonelier. I headed for the back roads, out in the woods where nobody was, but that just spooked me, wondering what was out there. I decided to try walking around town. It would be good for me, help me get rid of my bit of a paunch, and get me outside at the same time. So I tried to start a little routine. I would have dinner at the burger joint, since I couldn't cook in my office, and then I would go kick back for an hour or so, and then I'd walk around town. I'd make it into an exercise thing and walk so long every night. The first night, I felt much better. There's something about walking that is more intimate than driving. You can take the time to really examine things, and the physical nature of it leaves your mind free to think. One night, about two weeks into this new enterprise, while I was walking along, I got the feeling I was being followed. Now I'm a big guy, and I don't worry too much, as I can take care of myself. I had been in a few bar fights in my youth, and I knew how to win. But this idea of being followed kind of bothered me, so I quickly ducked down an alley and changed directions. I headed back to the office, but then it occurred to me that whoever was following me might go right along, and I didn't want anyone hanging around there. It was just too isolated, down there alone all night, and I didn't want anyone to know I was in there. So I decided to walk on over to Ruth's cafe and hang out for a bit until whoever it was gave up, and then I would go back to the office. I did that, and when I left, I still had this weird feeling that I was being watched and followed. I wasn't sure what to do, so I just went on back to the office, but instead of going inside, I left it locked up and got in my car and drove off. I ended up spending the night on my buddy Jim's couch. The next night, I went ahead with the walk as I wanted to see if I would feel that way again. I walked around a bit, senses heightened, and then I went into the burger joint, as it was still open. I had once again felt like I was being followed. I hadn't seen anyone either time, and I was beginning to think that I was just paranoid. But for some reason, I didn't feel comfortable going to the office, and I don't know why. So I stayed at Jim's again. I couldn't just move into gyms. I had to figure out what was going on. I decided to just stay at the office the next night and see how it felt, not go for a walk or anything. I was just sitting there, watching the trucks go by, when I saw something really big and dark quickly pass the front of the building and duck into the rear. I can tell you, this really scared me after everything that had been going on. I quietly checked the locks, making sure the doors were secure, and I wished I had Jim's dog along with me. He was a border collie, and he was a good watchdog. I just sat there in the dark, and then I started to hear what sounded like someone talking, although far away. In fact, it sounded like a party, people's voices visiting all together, but far in the distance. And then I heard what sounded like monkey chatter, but also far away. I was now really perplexed. What was going on? I had the same feeling of being watched, though there wasn't any way anyone could see into the building, as I had put all the tarps up. I wished I had cut the tall weeds on that back lot, as it made a perfect place to hide. I now quietly called Jim, and I told him what was going on, and he said that he would be right over. I was too scared to even go get in my car, and I couldn't call the police, since I wasn't even supposed to be sleeping there. I heard him drive up to the front door, and I was soon out the door and in his car, leaving the building locked up. Another night on his couch for me. The next day, I called a landscape place, and I had them come and cut down all the tall weeds in that back lot. It was a start at making the place less creepy, I thought. I was fine there during the day, but as soon as night fell, I started to get weirded out. I was determined to not stay at Jim's that night, but to tough it out at the office. I didn't want to wear out my welcome. I ended up in the robber's hideaway after hearing something scratching the walls outside. It wasn't like mice or any kind of animal. It was a long scratching that started at the top of the wall and went clear to the bottom. Somebody had to be tall to do this. I had no idea why anything would want to scare me. Could it be my soon-to-be ex-wife putting someone up to it? It was totally unlike anything she would do. 
I actually called and I asked her about it. She was very civil and said I needed to get out of there, but she didn't offer the spare room at the house. She then added that I should quit drinking. We were back to square one. She never believed anything I said, it seemed. That afternoon, as I was sitting there working, I got mad, just plain mad. I had enough problems going on, and I didn't need any more, and whoever was messing with my mind was going to be sorry. I missed my nightly walks, and I decided I wasn't going to let anyone take that from me. Those walks had been my only sanity through everything. So that evening, I went for a nice long walk, but I was now carrying a small twenty two pistol in my pocket, and that made me feel better. But I knew that I would be seriously underarmed if anything really big came after me. But so far, I hadn't seen anything but that fleeting moment of something running past the front window. I now had started parking my car in the front, next to the door, under the streetlight, where I could make a getaway while seeing if anyone was there. But this time, I had no intention of leaving. I was going to put on my war paint and make a stand. I had had enough. My walk went well, until I got over by the church, and then I felt like someone was watching me again. The community church has a big thicket behind it, where the creek comes through town, and it's always been kind of spooky and mysterious over there. I didn't go any closer, more than about a half block from it, as it was too dark and scary. The more I thought about it, that seemed to be where this feeling always started, when I got in the area of the thicket. So I just stopped, and I stood there for a while, looking around. I then noticed someone in the shadows by the church, or rather, I should say I noticed someone smoking a cigarette, as I could see it glowing in the dark. I stood there, watching, and the smoker did the same. But then it moved, and I could now see two cigarettes. That seemed really weird to me. Why would someone smoke two cigarettes? And it wasn't two people. They were too close together. It finally dawned on me that what I was seeing were eyes glowing in the dark. Now I felt a chill go up my spine, and the hairs on the back of my neck literally stood up. I don't think I've ever been so scared. The scratching on the walls was nothing compared to this. My heart rate went way up, and I could barely suck in a breath. For a few seconds, I didn't dare to move. Whatever this thing was, it was tall, because those eyes were a good two feet higher than mine. And like I said, I'm a big guy at 6'3". I know it's bad to show fear in a situation like this, but I must have been emanating it. I was so scared. I realized that I had my hand in my pocket, fingering my loaded gun. So I decided it might be prudent to show the gun. It might be a good deterrent. I've been told to never reveal that you're armed unless you intend to use the gun. And believe me, I intended to if that thing came out at me. I pulled the gun out and I casually held it, barrel pointed at the ground. I know the thing saw it, because immediately it turned away from me where I could no longer see its eyes, but I knew it was still there. I decided I needed to get out of there. Being a church, the grounds were fairly large, and there weren't any houses nearby. I was pretty much out there all alone. I started slowly walking back towards the residential part of town. I could always bang on someone's door if this thing came after me. I tried not to turn to look to see if it was following me, but I couldn't help it. I didn't see anything. I then remembered how I vowed to take my life back and not be afraid, and I got mad again. I turned and I shouted out to it, I don't know who you are, but if you don't leave me alone, you'll have hell to pay. I was mad. I then heard the most mournful sound. It was low, and it almost sounded like a growl, getting higher and ending in a kind of crying sound. I knew then that this was something that was not part of my world. Where it came from, I didn't know. But I knew that it was a wild thing, and it did not belong here in town. I was terrified, but I managed to remember what my dad had always told me, that there's a logical explanation for everything. I'm not a superstitious person, and I have my dad to thank for that because every time I was scared of something as a kid, he would make me sit down with him and analyze it and figure it out. He also helped me understand how the human mind can see patterns where there really aren't any and turn them into spooks and such. But I knew this thing was real, because it was now following me again, and it didn't seem to be as cautious or afraid of being seen. 
It was just right there, next to that house in the shadows. I could see its eyes glowing red, and its outline, which was massive. It was definitely real, but what was it? I realized my little pistol wouldn't even make a dent in a creature that large. I decided to just go on back to the office and see what it would do. I slowly walked back, and the fear seemed to be a bit less, or maybe I was managing to control it better. I got to the office, unlocked the front door, and went in. Glad that the burger joint was still open, and there were people over there. It would close in about half an hour. Before long, the burger joint's neon lights were off, and I was alone on Main, except for the robber's hideaway down the street of it. But I no longer felt lonesome. I cracked open a book, and I tried to read, but my mind was way too distracted, wondering what was outside, and what this creature was doing. I just don't care anymore, I said out loud to myself, and I went outside, standing by the front door. I remembered my brother once telling me that I was the only one who had the power to change my life. Just then, right on cue, a police cruiser drove by. I watched as he turned around and came back, slowing down and then stopping. He asked me if everything was okay, and I told him it was. He told me to have a nice night, and he turned back around and continued down the street, leaving me shaking my head at my own paranoia. Nobody cared if I was living in my own building and as long as I didn't do anything to make someone complain, I would be okay here. I didn't need to sneak around. I went back inside, and I put up the tarps, and I went to bed. I know that some people believe you can influence things with your mind, but I don't really believe that. But I do think that your attitude is picked up in subtle ways by others, and I think that's what happened to me with this creature, because after that night, I never saw it again. I think it somehow noticed that it wasn't dealing with a victim anymore. My entire attitude changed, and I began to look more at what was right with my life. For now, I had a shelter, and everything would soon work its way out, and I knew I would eventually get a home again. I knew this because I would make it happen. Human intention is a very powerful thing. I continued going for my walks, and I never felt like I was being watched again, even when I went over by the church. I eventually lost that paunch, and I felt better from the exercise, and I started taking off at lunch and walking then too. Pretty soon, I was on a new bicycle that I had bought, and before long, I was riding in bike marathons for charity, and I made a lot of new friends this way. My wife and I got divorced, and she got the house, but she also got the house payments. That freed me to get a nice little apartment. I decided to sell the office and just work from home and that cash gave me a nice buffer. I no longer walk at night. I instead ride my bike every afternoon, and then work some in the evenings. But once in a while, I'm in the area by the thicket, and I wonder just what that thing was, and what its intentions had been. I guess I will never know. I do know that fear is one of humankind's most powerful emotions, and I never want to live that way again. In a way, I have that creature to thank for making me aware of this. If you enjoy our content, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, like and comment down below, and follow us on social media. The links are in the description of this video and on our channel page. Also, if you've had an encounter and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. As always, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for listening.